So, welcome. So here's what the night is going to look like. Um, I'll be doing a brief introduction here for five minutes, and then Manus will be setting the scene. He's the chairperson of ProSilva. Um, then we hand over to so Teddy Cashman will be speaking about the National Deer Management Strategy. And I've heard a little bit of that already this evening. It sounds very interesting. Then we have a positive approach to deer management in Barnes Court from Matt Stewart, which also seems like a great case study. We will have um, questions and discussion for whatever time we want to. We can go over the hour if we want to, or you can leave if you want. Um, and if you put your questions and comments in the chat window, that'd be great. And then we'll, we'll wrap up and finish. So this is just a little... Um, note here, if you're a member of the Society of Foresters, you can claim CPD points for this webinar. And to do that, you should email ProSilva, the email here with webinar CPD in your subject and your name and the body of the email. So um, that email will be taken as permission to share your details with the Society of Forest Foresters for the allocation of CPD points. So that's not for everybody, but if you are, if that is relevant for you, then please um, make a note to do that. And I'll reiterate that at the end as well. So a little bit of brief introductions. My name is Anna Brown. I'm a forest owner and my forest is in Kildare. It was planted in 1995. I'm very familiar with deer damage and I'm also a techie. So I'll be making things things go smoothly here um, tonight. I'm also a member of ProSilva. Manus Crowley is the chairperson of ProSilva. He's a forester and ecologist and the managing director and forestry consultant with Enfor Limited, working in forestry since 2006. Teddy Cashman is a dairy farmer from the outskirts of Cork City. And he's just jumped in from some a calving to attend this. He's been involved at a leadership level in multiple rural-based organizations for the last 30 years. He currently is the independent chairperson of the National Deer Management Strategy Group. And last but not least, Matt Stewart joined Abercorn Estates in Tyrone in 2012, where today he occupies the position of chief executive and agent. He's been managing its ever-increasing forest resource in accordance with principles of continuous for cover forestry and have plenty of experience with the deer in that context. So I'm gonna hand over to Manus now, um, who'll be setting the scene. And I'll, I'll be driving his presentation, so you might hear me, he might be asking me to, to move things on. So Manus, over to you. All right, thanks, thanks Anna. Um, so on behalf of everyone in ProSilva Ireland, I'd like to welcome you all to the first in this year's series of uh, webinars and uh, I'll acknowledge and thank uh, DAFM for supporting this evening's event through the Forestry Support Fund. So welcome to all our members and uh, perhaps some people who don't actually know who ProSilva are. So I'll just give a little brief introduction into who ProSilva Ireland are. So we're a, a not-for-profit voluntary organisation founded in uh, the year 2000. And we're part of a wider international network of ProSilva organisations across uh, 20 December. 27 member countries. So uh, ProSilva Ireland is a, we're an all Ireland organization and we promote continuous cover forestry and close to nature uh, management systems. So you might be wondering what, what is CCF? So CCF aims to uh, integrate multiple forest functions while maintaining a permanent forest structure. And some of these forest functions that we'd have are um, protection of soils and water, conservation of ecosystems and enhancement of natural habitats, production of quality timber, amenity and recreation, and also the promotion of diversity within forests and uh, resilience, particularly around diseases and pests and climate resilience, and the storing of carbon through carbon sequestration in soils and within timber. So the pro-silver principles generally support the idea of forests which are both ecologically and economically economically sustainable. So that's just a bit of background to who ProSilva are. So just uh, I'd like to lay the context of why are deer a problem? Maybe everybody in the chat is aware, but um, just within recent years, there's been a, a, a change in gender in Ireland. Um, there's a wider change in attitudes towards forestry. Typically, previously, forestry was viewed as um, generally production orientated with monocultural type forest management. But increasingly, the, the public and forest policy in general has seen a move away from this production uh, monoculture forestry into a more diverse forestry and using alternative forest management systems. So as foresters and ecologists and forest owners, we're expected that our forests should deliver this more diverse type forestry. But 
aside from potentially climate change, one of the single greatest barriers to this diverse development in Ireland is deer. And uh, look, we'll just outline briefly why that may, might be, sorry. Um, so we've increasingly seen more um, planting uh, on afforestation sites and reforestation sites of much larger rates of native woodland planting and diverse forestry planting. So here in this slide, you can see this is a, a native woodland site in Carlo, uh, just got to one, sorry. And um, that's a perfect example of broadleaf damage from deer to just snap the leader in half and uh, generally browse. This site, there was very little deer when we planted first and now it just appeared overnight almost. So as foresters and land managers were required to put up these very expensive deer fences, this is from a site in Ballymore Eustis. Um, you might see there's a, an extension being put on the fence here. The deer were jumping over the fence that was well over six foot high, and we had to extend it by a further two feet to stop them from getting in. So it's a massive challenge for diverse afforestation. Can you skip it on, please, Anna? Um, CCF relies on natural processes. We're trying to emulate nature through close nature management. So it's heavily reliant on natural regeneration. And on the left-hand side, um, you can see there, there's Western red cedar and uh, very badly frayed. This is from a site up in Wicklow in, in Knockrath. Um, this is beautiful cedar. It's a couple of years old and completely destroyed by deer. On the right-hand side is our Poor past chair, lean burn, stand in the middle of some very nice um, Douglas fir regeneration. This regen has been minded and looked after for six or seven years. And overnight, the deer will come in and just fray a tree out of it. That tree is pretty useless now. Um, it's showing you some of the challenges of trying to manage these sites in heavy deer areas. Um, next slide, please, Anna. This is just a little case study in a way. There, these are two Norway spruce sites. Uh, one is from Wicklow. Both sites have been managed for CCF. The Wicklow site has heavy deer numbers, typical bark stripping going on. Once that bark is removed, it, it opens up a, a pathway for fungus and that to get into the timber and completely damage the timber, making it commercially poor quality. Um, there's very little floral development on the ground floor from deer browsing. On the right hand side then is another CCF site, Norris Bruce uh, in Offaly, and there's very few deer here, almost none, and we're getting lovely oak regeneration occurring. So it's, it's a lovely contrast of two Norris Bruce sites with the same management in place, but just showing you the challenges. Just the last slide, please, Anna. And again, you know, we're not just talking about forests for timber production or diverse forests, we're also looking at our native woodland sites. And these are two um images from uh, the National Parks in Ireland. So Wicklow National Park on the left there, you can see there's a small exclosure made and outside of the exclosure, very little ground floor development, just extremely heavily browsed. And within the fence, we've got good quality or very strong uh, holly growth to current. On the right hand side, the famous Killarney National Park, this, this is an area where uh, rhododendron was cleared out of and you can see all the brash in the ground from the rhododendron. Within the exposure, profuse regeneration of uh, native species, headers, roan, holly. So it's a, it's a star contrast. So, but that's just a very brief uh, context of why deer are important uh, and it's important to talk about. So I'll go straight over to you, Teddy, and let to explain to people what's going on. Thanks. I'm just going to go through and um, just give a bit of background as to where the deer management, the national policies around deer management at the moment and where we come from and where we're hoping to get to. I think I suppose <coughs> we need to go back to the start of the process, which is probably September 2022. Um, I was appointed by the Minister Independent Chairman of, of the of what was to be a replacement of the Deer Management Forum. And um I was appointed in September 22 and it was a question of, you know, deer management hadn't been addressed for probably four years or, or more at that stage. Um, I think the deer management forum finished in 2018 and the thing was in abeyance and we had COVID in between and the whole issue of COVID and the lack of hunting in between also would have um, exacerbated deer numbers as well. So there was lots of challenges there and it was very evident, particularly in areas like Wicklow and I heard it, you know, as, as, as an outsider, 
uh, it was very clear to me that deer were a big problem. You would hear from Wicklow farmers in particular. So anyway, um, we were um, the the process was started in um, twenty twenty two in September, and um, I suppose the question was how to address this particular scenario, how to go about it, and how to engage people within the process. So we looked in very much um, what we did at the at the beginning was put together a working group. Um, with representatives from both the Department of Agriculture and the NPWS, it was a joint approach from both departments. And um, we have Damien Barrett from um, Department of Agriculture and David Quinn and Seppi Hona um, from NPWS, Claire Crowley, Ferdy Marnell and Wesley Atkinson. And we also asked Ken Sweeney from Creel to, to join as well. And this year, John Casey from Tagus is also part of the group. And Paddy Comerford from NPWS was with us until he retired. So we set up a working group first to see what to do and how to how to approach the scenario. And you know, as part of the work of the working group, we looked into how what the, the work of the forum prior to what we done before we started. And um it was very clear that the forum had done a lot of good work in identifying the problems deer were causing. And I think Manus has outlined a lot of those in relation to the forestry just now, but there were a lot of others in relation to you know animal welfare and TB and grazing and road traffic and all that kind of stuff. It had been investigated quite thoroughly by the previous forum, but there hadn't been a whole lot of solutions come to it because I think, you know, I think that the the, the makeup of the forum wasn't conducive to, to solving problems. I think it was a case of it was um, too big a body to, to, to get down to doing the nitty gritty. And um, we believed having looked at that was it was a different process or a different way of approaching the problem should be attempted. So as I said, we looked into what the forum had done and um, all the good work they'd done and read the reports. And um, there were a couple of people in our group had been involved with the forum, Ferdy and, and Wesley in particular. And uh, I think that was very useful. And following on from that, we um, had uh, a good bit of study of the work that had been done by uh, under the auspices, I suppose, really of the Wicklow Uplands Council in relation to setting up GMUs in Wicklow. Um, and their report was published, I think, in March of 2022. I think that was a very good case study from the point of view of how to approach uh, deer management area by area. And um, when you look across the rest of the world and the rest of Europe as the whole deer are being controlled and managed, it's been done by equivalents of deer management units, local areas, uh, uh, collaboration of local groups um, coming together to address deer in a, in a, a quantifiable manner, you know, in, in, in bite sizes that, that can be managed. I think that was the, the big outcome we got from the Wicklow Open Council um, work. The next part of our process then was to get a general feel from the general public as to what people's views were around deer and deer management and um, what the general take was out there. And we um, launched a survey into um, people's attitudes towards deer and how deer is currently managed in, um, I think it was about the 20th of December 2022, and it ran until the 10th of February that year. And we had quite a number of respondents, and I mean, maybe. Um, I think it's it's very useful just this this slide gives you kind of the breakdown of the respondents to the survey and then um, farmer, landowner, forester, ecologist, academic, non government organization, public bodies, farm representative organizations, um sector. You know, you could see it from, from the screen in front of you. It was a broad ranging response to the survey. And I think fifteen hundred people um responding to the survey is, is quite a strong response. So I, I think um, it gave us, you know, the, the results from this give us a fair bit of direction as to what people's views were out there. Um, and I, I, I think it was very useful. And you can move up to the next page and we'll just look at some of the outcomes from this, if you, that's okay. Yeah, that's it, yeah, stay there for a minute. Look, what we have here are, are the, um, what people felt were the main impacts of deer numbers across urban and rural Ireland. And the biggest one was biodiversity loss and damage. And that kind of comes back to Manus's point several ago, um, when you see the the the, the grazing within the, the forestry and what, what they're doing there. Damage to agriculture came second, road traffic accidents came third, damage to high value nature conservation sites came fourth, damage to farm infrastructure, fencing, etc., forestry damage, um, impaired deer welfare, threat to animal health, TB, extra, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I would think that I mean if you have one, two thirds of respondents are flagging up something, it's 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 quite significant. So this gives you a fair idea of what people feel the impacts of deer are. And I suppose the fact that deer numbers have um, increased so much over the last number of years, um, people have 
you know, the impacts are are, are, are more widely known, more widely felt. So I think th from that point of view, this, this, you know, the fact that biodiversity loss and damage is up there at the very top is quite significant, really, because, you know, you'd wonder how many people in the general public um, will be aware of where the biodiversity loss is happening, but um, it came up very high. Next page. And page 15, I think, Anna. Now, I suppose that the question is how we are going to deal with deer, and I suppose the biggest one here is deer culling. And the next one is the ports for landowners to control deer, which in essence really is deer culling again. Commercially successful wild, wild venison market that's allied with deer culling also, and uh, increased access to, to education and training for hunters. And um, that's also deer culling. Um, so, so look, pretty much everything that's involved here has got to do with, with culling of deer, reducing numbers, getting numbers back in line. Um, as a means of addressing the, the, the impacts steers are having are having. And I suppose the, the point to be made here really is was is it's deer impacts of the scenario. I mean there have been a lot of talk around counting of deer and other things like that, but counting deer, as far as we can ascertain it, is, is not something you can do unless you're in a very confined and defined area and have very good um you know, Matt will give you background to do it and and then close the station how they're managing to do it in, in his his piece. But in a general across the country scenario to trying to count deer is next to near impossible. So what we're looking at really is where the impacts are and man has showed, showed severe impacts um, in a forestry setting. Other impacts will be in grazing and farming, impacts will be numbers of road traffic accidents, you know, such as it's, it's part of the impacts they're having and how do you relate those impacts and where the impacts are severe, you know, that's where you would, would have to engage with, with a, a culling program in a particular area. So I suppose, as I said, we ran the survey from um, the middle of December, 20 December to the 10th of February. The next stage of the process after that then was to engage with um, stakeholders, hunters, foresters, farmers, um, NGOs, and um, the departments, Quilta, all the different uh, people who had um, interest in management and were impacted by deer. What I did um, as best I could with most organizations and individuals when, when necessary, was to deal with people one by one first sit down and listen to what people had to say and get a feel for where people are, were related to um deer management and what, what the impacts were and what they saw as being the issues and what they saw as being red herrings and otherwise so for me as an independent chairman it was very important to listen to what people had to say from the point of view of this process um we felt it was sent the stakeholders were central to the to resolving or to coming with the, the solutions to deer management in ireland so we had um, a stakeholder meeting with on, at the end of April, at which we presented the, the results in the survey, a few pieces which I've shown you here. And we also um, set out the guidelines as where we go next with the process. And what we wanted to do was get stakeholders in, involved in the development of what the proposals would be to resolve geomanagement in Ireland. That was very important. And to that end, um, I put the stakeholders at the meeting on the, the 29th of April that it was important that they come up with what needed to be done to resolve the problem. We've had a, a good deal of discussion, particularly around the forum, as to what the problems were, what the impacts were. We were coming to a phase now as to what did we need to do, what needed to be changed, what needed to be addressed to try and deal with deer management in Ireland. And to that effect, we set up four subcommittees resulting from that meeting in um, Port Leash last um, April of last year, around the different headings. And um, first one was on venison, and that was chaired by David Quinn from the Department of Agriculture. The second on collaboration and groups, and that was chaired by Ken Sweeney from Quilton. The collaboration is very important from the point of view of deer management units and other ways. The third was on legislation. The fourth was that was chaired by Paddy Comerford of NPWS. The th fourth was on education, which was chaired by John Casey from Tagus. And the fifth then was the solutions for land management which was chaired by Seppi Horner from the forestry section of the Department of Agriculture. And what we did in that scenario was we, we put together a reasonably tight time frame around the, the groups and um, from the point of view of, of output from the groups. So they wouldn't become talking shops as a question of trying to find solutions here, trying to put together uh, proposals and trying to find commonality. And we also put in the terms of reference for the groups that there, were also, there was also a possibility if you, you know, we weren't able to accommodate everybody from every Every group, every every organization in every group, so that if an organization had something to impart 
aren't relating to another topic that wasn't in the group they were involved that they could bring that up and it would be fed into the the overall group of recommendations that would come out afterwards so we set a time frame from early may to mid-july for the groups and they were to report back by mid-july with their proposals which they did and um each group we had i think it was 62 people involved in the groups or 64 i think actually um we had well over 100 people applied to take part and we had to you know we couldn't take individuals and um, we didn't have room for it we would have if we could and um most organizations um got two to three people involved over, across the, the five groups that were involved but we tried as best we could to involve as many stakeholders in the process as possible and what came out of that process then was a number of recommend recommendations from each group and from that we distilled and there was quite a bit of um commonality between the recommendations you might go to page um 11 please um sorry i'm taking these pages from the report and the report is available to everybody else uh, um at, online so there's no problem getting that and um um has been published there for the last number of months um since before christmas i think um look i suppose we broke down the recommendations and i i, I would go to pains and say that these are the kind of the the, the the overarching recommendations. There's quite a few more that are in, uh, that are uh, that are included in the report that came from the subcommittees that aren't being ignored. That they will be looked at and, and addressed um, over the, the the process of of, of uh, implementation. But I suppose we broke down the recommendations into short term and medium term, term recommendations, and what the main ones were. And I think it is important just to just give an idea as to what the program of work is and have a bit of a um, a background afterwards as to where we're going next with this. And the first one was the short term recommendations and the main one here is the appointment of a program manager to set up deer management units with local coordinators. The biggest issue we've had with deer management, in my view in Ireland for the last number of years, is that it's been everybody's responsibility and nobody's. So it's important that a deer management coordinator, program manager, is put in place to address the issues, to, to make the reports, to be able to act as, as a facilitator. Um, a full-time person that's involved with deer management. I think that's that's very important as a first step. And so that's the first thing. The second piece is the program manager in conjunction with deer management strategy group to develop the implementation plan that, that speaks for itself. And um, we need that kind of full-time person in place to do that. The third one is set up deer management units in critical hotspot areas initially following on from localized stakeholder, stakeholder meetings. So look, it's very clear um, that and I said it earlier in the presentation that deer management units are probably the most practical way of um, dealing with deer in local areas. And to do that, you need coordination and you need buy-in from the people who are involved in the areas and you need a contingent, you know, a consistency of, of approach. And that's the biggest issue, you know, that you have a consistent approach in an area and then everybody's bought into and there's a work in getting those set up and getting them organized. And the the work in, in on the auspices of the Wicklow Uplands Council uh, demonstrated that and there's you know it is something that needs to be done so we've looked for funding for this we've been you know granted funding for setting up deer management units and for the appointment of the program manager and i'll get into that a bit more in a minute the third the fourth one is the re revision of the open seasons order to align with current dates in northern ireland in the first instance that brings stags back to the first of august and bring hinds to the um end of march so um, and that's in train but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute as well the fifth one is investigate the feasibility of, of um establishing a deer management agency and research the best model for such an agency setup. We've done some work on this already. We've had a good look at, at Nature Scott around that one, and we had a good bit of work to do on that one yet. But I suppose the main reason behind that is you know an overarching body that is responsible for deer management, that there are good um there's good facts and figures, you know, it's statistics. We need to make sure that the the numbers being hunted that the the thing has been run and um, you need an overarching body for that. Now that will take a bit to be done, but we will be investigating the different options that are there for that in the short term. Sixth is to investigate support incentives um, necessary for national management role, including for, venison, for the venison market. And I think the venison one is quite a critical one to this from the point of view. If we're going to up the hunting, we're going to have to have an outlet for venison. And that's an issue we're addressing um, pretty soon, I must say. Um, Number seven then is reviewed the change to statutory instruments and current legislation. Some of that's got to do around venison as well and the, the numbers that you can shoot or that you can supply to restaurants. And we're looking at that um, at the moment and that's in train within the Department of Agriculture. 
and that's been currently. And there will be issues around, you know, cold chain and, and management of meat, and there will be other regulations that will be allied to that. But it's to take some of the log jams out of that situation. The number eight then is the revision of the process of section 42 license applications on the wildlife effects to ensure a consistency of approach. And that's a, a job work that's been done within the Parks and Wildlife Service currently. And there's been extra staff um, have been um, uh, seconded to that. And it, it's up and running currently, or it's, it, it's, it's in train anyway. The medium term um, recommendations are to review the results of the feasibility of the Deer Management Agency. That's um, secure changes to legislation following the Wildlife Act and other deer related legislation that relates up to some of the ones above. Not in the imp impacts. Um, arising from, from the basically if we get up and running from the point of view of um, deer management and monitoring the impacts as to whether it's actually having an effect. Uh, review the open season order again as required on the foot of three above and that will be an ongoing, the open season order will be on, there will be ongoing reviews in that and that will be in consultation with stakeholders so there, there, there's, it's something that will be looked at on an ongoing basis. Engage with state bodies to develop a structured deer management policy in state lands and uh, we've we've been addressed this with both Quilt and NPWS in the last while, and that's that's ongoing, and um, we, we have ongoing conversations going on there at the moment. Phase certification of all hunters over the next three to five years. That's to look for um, a consistency of training across hunters, and that's something that has to be done in collaboration, but it's something that, that we will be looking at. The integration of deer management module, module into agricultural forestry and land management and environmental training courses, and um, that's something we're looking at at the moment from the point of view of um, getting into um, both the agricultural colleges and the agricultural degrees and forestry training as well, that there will be a, a deer module so that people can understand the issues around deer and John Casey and Tigers is progressing that currently. A review of forest design and scheme specification in relation to deer management. What that relates to pretty much really is things like um, deer lawns and deer corridors within new forestry that's planted to allow areas to hunt deer and um, to our areas, the allow areas that would be appropriate to put high seats in. in, in in, in place um, from the point of view of deer management. So that's, you know, it's it's something long-term. Currently, a lot of forestry um, occupies the full area of land and there's the deer have only one place to come, it's out of the forestry and or to, into the clear ground next door or to whatever they can get into, but there, there's nowhere within the forestry in a lot of cases to be able to manage deer. So that's that's an issue that um, it will need discussion and, and it needs to be addressed and it's quite, common across Europe that there would be um, areas for um, for deer management within, within forests. So there are the recommendations that are that um, we, we put forward to the Minister and um, both Ministers, Minister Noonan and um, Mr. McConnell, McConnell, Minister for Agriculture. We, we put the the recommendations forward. We had, sorry, we had um, a stakeholder forum at the end of um, August last year. Um, to present the recommendations to all the stakeholders. Um, there were their own recommendations, but we, we outlined the three main ones that that, to, that that were at the top of the scenario, and we discussed some of the rest, and we had a good two and four discussion with stakeholders. And we've, you know, committed to go back to stakeholders if there's any major change or major engagement happening in this process here, so people will be up to speed on and, and what's going on. So we presented this to the Minister uh, in September last year. Um, the minister accepted proposals as, as did the minister for um, Minister Noonan and um, took a couple of months to get stuff through the system from the point of view of get the report put together, get the report published. It took till December really, I suppose, before um, the, the report was published. Uh, it went through cabinet also, and I think it was the 9th of December. So at this stage, the report is now government policy um, and the, the, the recommendations within, which it basically means we're up and running from the point of view of starting to implement the project. So um, it's been, you know, working through government takes a bit of time, but it is through the process and we have government approval for the process of, of moving on to management in Ireland. So where we are at at the moment is uh, the appointment of a program manager is um, is in train and we're, we're working through the HR scenario in the Department of Agriculture at the moment around that one. The revisions of the open season order is also in train. It's gone to the legal department in um, in MPWS and it's in train. And uh, um, I'm not sure whether it will be implemented for this season or not, but there's, there's a possibility it might be. The revision of the process section 42 license applications is also in train. 
in this investigation of the Geomanagement management agency, we're looking at that and we're, we, we'll be looking at that in the next month or so. Investigation and support incentives, we'll, we'll, we'll be getting into that with the, we may um, look, we were pretty good at a time looking at the venison scenario currently as to see what, what, what's the appropriate, what the appropriate, appropriate action is there. And the review of to statutory instruments and current legislation, and, and that's also in train. So look, basically, there isn't going to be enough happen around geo management until we get a program manager in place. And when we once we have somebody in place, we can start putting together um, reports, putting together what we need to do and um, start a, a, the process of um, recruiting coordinators for geo management units. So the program manager comes first, then coordinates for geo management units, and hopefully we'll get that up and running in the next couple of months. So I think that's just a general overline um, uh, outline and as to what's involved in the process at the moment and um, so i think i'll leave it at that and i'll hand over to matt good evening everybody thanks teddy for your presentation um i anna I'm, I'm going a bit rogue here because i sent you my uh slides on deer management and realized they didn't really talk about baron's court and didn't give you the background to the estate so uh, i've got uh, in, in a true here's one i prepared earlier spirit i have a few slides about baron's court which i'm just going to share with you all to set the scene and um, Barron's Court Estate, for those of you who are not aware, is uh, located in County Tyrone, and it's about 2,200 hectares in size. We've got roughly 560 hectares of agricultural land. Uh, the majority of that is let out on annual grazing license to sheep, uh, beef and dairy farmers who will graze it or will take um, silage. We don't have very much cropping uh, where we are because... Uh, it's very wet with us, um, but we've got about 139 hectares, which we farm in hand, uh, and we have a very small herd of herd of cattle on that, but the majority of it is um, managed for feedstock production. So we produce a lot of grass silage, which we sell to an AD plant and anaerobic digester down the road. But um, the dominant land use on the estate is forestry, and we have just over 1400 hectares of, of forestry or land under management by the forest department. Um, I'll come on to the history of the of the of the estate and forestry and the Northern Ireland Forest Service in a second. But we've currently got technically about 61 hectares that are subject to a lease with the Forest Service, but uh, that is imminently coming to an end. I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in, in a second. Uh, the remainder of the estate consists of open ground, uh, lakes and formal gardens. Um, our main activities, briefly, forestry obviously is the big one. We also do a lot of game shooting. We have a, a, a large um, game shoot on the estate. Deer stalking, of course, salmon fishing, let agricultural land, as I referred to, we have some in-hand agricultural activity. We dabble a bit in leisure. We've got some uh, holiday cottages, uh, some facilities in our stable yard for meetings and events, very much into renewable energy and um, wood fuel as well. So we produce some firewood and we're generally involved in, in property asset management and, and provide asset management services as well as a business. Um, to the left there in that slide, you can see uh, we call the, it's the mansion house. It's the principal resident uh, residential property on the estate. Very important historic building. It's entirely heated or pretty much majority heated by this froling wood chip boiler, which uh, produces about 350,000 kilowatt hours of heat per annum, which is equivalent of 30 odd thousand litres of oil. And all that wood chip is uh, sourced from the uh, estate. So we're fairly self-sufficient there in heat. Um, we've got some solar panels producing a combined 36,000 units of electricity. And we're consuming about three quarters of that ourselves. And uh, coming up to two years ago, we bought a wind farm. The wind farm was on the estate um, owned by SSE Renewables, uh, who were our tenant. And we entered into negotiations to buy it from them. So we are the proud owners of a uh, productive but quite old wind farm. But that's been an interesting addition to the business. Um, I'll skip over that, but that's just about our uh, grassland production. And, and this is relevant to what we're going to talk about um, on, on deer as well. 
but we produce about 6,000 tonnes of agricultural feedstock in the form of either grass or whole crop silage or hybrid rye predominantly to uh, supply uh, feed a biogas renewable energy plant. And really coming on to the main themes tonight and, and the forestry, we've got 1400 hectares. We have a head forester in Jim Simpson, who has been with us for many years, extremely experienced and uh, has been leading our, our forestry department for a long time and, and the, the, the uh, conversion to CCF. All our forestry operations on the estate are, car uh, are contracted out. We have an excellent uh, relationship with a local forestry contractor who does all our harvesting and planting and maintenance. The forest resource is predominantly located across the uh, lower slopes and the bottom of, of the Barnes Court Valley with elevations ranging from 60 metres up to 250 metres above sea level. So we've got a, a good mixture of sheltered and exposed uh, stands. Various soil types, generally fertile, subject to drainage, of course, and uh, about yeah, 1100 millimetres of average rainfall a year. Um, important context here, 1919 Forestry Act uh, in, in, resulted in a 150 year lease being granted in January 1921 by the third Duke of Abercorn and the Forestry Commission, which is today's Northern Ireland Forest Service. And that was for about a thousand hectares. Um, but the lease terms were renegotiated in the mid-1990s, so that instead of all of that land coming back in 2071, from 1996 onwards, once the Forest Service fell their crop, that land reverts back to us. And we have uh, been predominantly restocking that. And uh, we therefore, as a result, have a, a growing in-hand forestry operation. As I referred to in my first slide, there's only about 60 odd hectares remaining subject to that lease. It says there to be felled in 2023. The last crop was felled in 2023. So uh, all of the land will be coming back in hand now. And in 2001, uh, the estate decided to manage this increasing forest resource in line with the CCF principles, um, which proves that Ireland is very much all about, of course, and our woodlands are FSC, Forestry Stewardship Council certified as well. So I'm going to now hopefully uh, seamlessly move on to my slide on deer management, which can you see, Anna? Yes, indeed, I can. Excellent. Good stuff. OK, so deer management, Barons Court. Um, the history of deer, they were first introduced to the West Deer Park, according to our records anyway, in April 1751. There were two bucks and nine does. Uh, these fallow deer apparently came from London via Dublin. And five does were are being recorded as having died within the, the first year, but the remainder were successful. And there is correspondence between the 8th Earl of Abercorn and his agent back in 1766, which at that time uh, made reference to a population of about 300 deer in the park, of which 200 were, were does. Now, culling uh, and therefore management, I suppose, commenced in 1767. And the fallow monopoly at that point was eventually lost to the, the Reds. A, to Red Deer. a second deer park was created in the late 19th century, mainly to in townlands to the east of the estate. And that was designed uh, as an imitation of the Scottish deer forests. And in 1891, uh, the records state that a Sika stag from Colebrook uh, which is an estate in Fermanagh, arrived during the rut and possibly attracted by red hinds. And Sika were then imported deliberately from 1892 onwards. And um, culling commenced in 1896. The deer parks on the estate were maintained until the late 1890s, but the, world, the First World War had a, obviously a devastating uh, impact on, on estate staff, the number of labour, the amount of labour that's available, and on, also on the deer herd. And by the 1920s, there were no deer or no red deer left. The fallow uh, died out in the 1950s, but Sika thrived and uh, remained dominant and are with us to this very day. So... 
Coming up to more recent times, um, in 1974, uh, there was significant damage uh, incurred to the uh, Let woodlands, but also the Inhan woodlands. This was being observed and recorded and was becoming a real problem. And the theory was that Hurricane Debbie in 1961, which had a devastating impact at Barronsport, I mean, it really was a destructive event, um, resulted in a lot of restocking afterwards. And of course, that restocking, if you fast forward to the 1970s, was becoming closed canopy at that point, leading to, the theory was, reduced grass and, and forage available, which was meaning that the, the deer attention and the pressure on the crop itself was, was intensified and more damage was, uh, was the result. There was also a problem with our neighbours as well. And... Um, there is a very famous writ which was served on the estate and I'll quote from the writ because it's quite interesting to, to hear from it or hear about it. The writ stated that uh, the estate basically was being pursued for, and I quote, damages for loss and damage sustained by reason of the escape of deer from the defendant's lands at Barons Court onto the plaintiff's lands at Leglands and further damages for trespass in relation to the aforesaid and further damages for nuisance in relation to the aforesaid, and further for the negligence of the defendant, his servants or agents, in and about the breeding, keeping, management, fencing, care, and control of deer on lands at Barronsport. So there was a wake-up call for the estate and that legal action was being taken against it because of deer. Ultimately, there was a claim there for a thousand pounds in damages. It was withdrawn before it got to court. But... As I say, it was a wake up call and really that led from the 1970s onwards from that point to a management policy and Barons Court has been endeavouring to manage its deer in a sustainable and professional way ever since. And we have uh, statistics uh, accordingly um, going back to that point. So there they are. Those are our, our, our deer. Um, stats are important. Uh, this is uh, a slide showing um, the 10-year stats of, of, of the deer call at Barons Court beginning in the 2012-2013 season and we keep good records so we record the number of stags, hinds, uh, stag calves, or prickets and hind calves. We make a note of their weight and that gives us an indication as to their health and uh, we also obviously record the number that we've culled overall. And we've got records going back, as I say, back to possibly even the 1960s, but certainly to the 1970s. And um, it's, it's a very interesting record to have. But our 10 year average there at the bottom, which is important to remember for the purposes of what we're talking about tonight, I want everybody to remember, is our 10 year average is 247 deer a year. It was up until that point. I can tell you that I haven't got the 22, 23 figures up there, but uh, we call 277 deer at Barons Court uh, a number uh, in the last season. So our management uh, process, well, it's uh, the, the management of the herd is overseen by our head gamekeeper. And we have a number of employed keepers on the estate who uh, carry out the cull. Uh, but we also have a large volunteer base, uh, friends and neighbours, people from all over who enjoy their stalking have uh, come and, and help us out with the cull. Uh, and, and they are a, a really important part of, of the team. Our facilities are pretty good. We've got uh, an approved game handling establishment, which allows us to take in the carcasses from the cull, process them. And we've established, which you'll see at the end, uh, a really good reputation for high quality venison. And um, we're very, very passionate about that and very keen to ensure that everything that is culled and even uh, our, from our shoot as well is professionally, carefully handled and gets into the food chain. And um, it's, it's all very much part of the, the wider picture. Infrastructure wise, uh, we have high seats throughout the estate to allow the team to, to ha have safe and effective opportunities to cull deer. We are trying to um, incorporate uh, deer lawns or open areas 
to facilitate stalking, either keyholing those in to problematic areas uh, of established forestry or, uh, and as Teddy referred to in his presentation, designing new plantings and our restocking um, with, with open areas to create these deer lawns. And th th there's uh, foot stalking taking place as well. We have a policy of paying what are what we call ex gratia payments. Now, these go back to the writ that was served upon us, um, where we obviously had a, a potential um, issue with the local community, which we didn't want. Um, and so what we do now is we pay a proportion of the value of the carcass to the landowners over whose land we've actually taken deer. So the estate has um, the right to, to shoot deer. It's got sporting rights beyond its actual land ownership. That's a result of the 1870 and 1882 land acts, which reduced a lot of the estates in size. But uh, sporting rights were, were still reserved to the original owners. So we've got shooting rights over substantial areas beyond which we actually own. And as you've seen there, going back to the importance of keeping good records, we record the number and the weight of the deer that are taken from those the, each farmer's land. And at the end of the season, we make a payment to them on a per kilo basis, which is based on 20% of the carcass value that we've been able to secure by, by selling it. And it's a it's a goodwill gesture. We we don't have to do it, but we're we're really happy to do it. Um, you've got to take a holistic approach on deer management. You can't just control the deer that are on the land we own. Um, and Teddy's group are trying to obviously uh, address the the fact that deer management is collaborative and involves all landowners coming together. And it's it is appreciated, I think, by the local community. And we also have Barons Court Deer Liaison Committee, which meets, um, usually meets annually. That's got, um, I sit on that along with our head gamekeeper, our head forester, and we have a representative from the Ulster Farmers Union at the table as well. And we usually have a committee member who is um, an external expert on deer or uh, is knowledgeable on deer. And that allows us all to come together to review how we're getting on identify any issues. So having the Ulster Farmers Union representative there allows the farming community to uh, have an input on the committee and bring any issues to the table for us. And it's all about building good relationships because it said, you know, we really need to be working collaboratively with everybody. Um, we've got a rifle range on the estate as well, which is great for, uh, from a safety point of view and um, zeroing rifles, but also it helps with, with training. And we have the, an arrangement with the British Association of Shooting and Conservation, the BASC, in that they have an exclusive deer stalking scheme on the estate. Um, this scheme is for BASC members. It's been running since 2015. And it really allows that uh, uh, BASC members who are interested in deer stalking who are in possession critically of a deer stalking certificate level one qualification, um, they can register on this scheme and can have uh, uh, an opportunity to come in and, and stalk at Barons Court. Um, so it's just for people who are interested in deer stalking, got the qualifications, but maybe don't have access to the land uh, or no landowners who've got deer. This gives them an opportunity to come down and get that experience. And that's been running very well. The um, BISC run the DSC uh, Deer Stalking Certificate one courses at Barons Court as well. Of course, usually runs a couple of times a year, covers safety, ecology of all deer species, firearms law, deer law across the UK, uh, test species recognition, handling, grolicking, game, meat hygiene, um, all, all of that. And it's a very good comprehensive qualification. And that's been uh, that training course has been run at Barons Court for 25 years and um, they can also move on to higher levels of qualification such as the DSC2 uh, that's not a course but it's more like a portfolio of evidence produced by the candidate with the assistance of a of, of an approved witness which basically uh, demonstrates you know a really uh, a higher level of experience of, of actually being in the field and, and culling deer safely and, and uh, professionally. Again, we can do all that at Barons Court through our partnership with the BASC. 
And we've got this intermediate day course, which is a fairly new addition by the BASC, and that provides students with two full days of stalking, during which they are guided by um, our own experienced stalkers, both in the field, and they get into the game larder as well, where they actually um, butcher deer. And that is uh, sort of the, the course between the DSC1 and the DSC2, and it prepares candidates for DSC2. So again, we're trying to help train people and give people opportunities to get involved in deer stalking as well. So continuous cover forestry and deer, well, everybody knows about CCF. Ultimately, um, at the heart of it is, is this objective that we've got to get acceptable levels of natural regeneration coming through and deer present a very clear and obvious risk to that. And our deer management policy must reflect our natural regeneration objectives. And um, how do you do that? Well, if you want to do that, you need really need to understand what impact your deer herd is having. And that's been sort of our challenge for the last 10, 15 years, I suppose, um, as, as our transition to CCF becomes more, uh, gains more traction and, and we're doing obviously more of it across a, a larger area. And um, it's also interesting to note that actually <laughs> CCF, there's an element of double-edged sword on this one because um, where we are getting some good levels of natural regeneration, we're getting an irregular canopy coming through, which is making it more difficult to actually see deer and more difficult, therefore, to cull them. So the more successful we are in some areas of CCF, the more difficult it is actually to control deer. So thinking about infrastructure, creating open areas, even within a successful CCF stand or um, uh, part of the estate is, is going to be really important and getting infrastructure right from the get-go is, is really important. Um, so the, the, the million dollar question has been, and probably will forever will be, you know, how many deer do you have? And we've probably only been able to answer that by pointing to two things. One is our colour records. So how many deer are we actually um, taking? But also we've, we've done an annual deer count every year for many, many years. Uh, Teddy touched on this as well. It's, it's not that effective, um, but we would do it uh, and still do it every year in March. And we divide the estate into three beats and three teams go out with uh, uh, torches basically and, and just they count what they see and it's as simple as that and in 2023 last year which is the last time we did the count we observed 307 and the previous year we saw 325 deer it's not scientific it's got its flaws but it's better than nothing and its real value is likely to be in consistency and repetition. So you do it at the same time every year. You're covering the same areas. It's by and large the same people. There's going to be a little bit of integrity in there, but it's not ideal. So to try and evolve this um, further, the, the next thing we did was in 2017, and this was based on an experience we had in a Scottish property, and again, Teddy refers to some of the lessons learned from Nature Scott uh, and, and their dealings with deer. But we had a sensitive site in Scotland, um, which uh, we were being encouraged to try and manage to get natural regeneration going over there. Uh, it was an area of special scientific interest. And um, over there, there was the herbivore impact assessment. And that really is a method of, of assessing browsing damage. And there are 57 permanent stops now established at Barons Court. They are monitored every spring. Um, we've done it every year since 2017, apart from 2020, which was the COVID year. And what this is, is an objective assessment of browsing pressure. It's pretty binary. And uh, at each of these stops, uh, an area of 25 meters, uh, a 25 meter area is visualized, radius uh, area is visualized and impact levels are assessed by the ecologist based on a scale ranging from either no impact to very high. And they're looking at seven distinct impact indicators. These are basal shoots, epicormic or lower shoots. They're looking for signs of bark fraying, uh, stripping and stem breakage. They look at seedlings up to 50 centimeters in height 
They also assess damage on saplings up to two metres in height. They look for preferentially browsed and grazed field layer species. They look at the sward and finally they look at ground disturbance. And these are all uh, recorded on a field data sheet, which there's an example uh, there. And you Hi, can Matt. see... Hi. Sorry, we're, we're getting out of time here. Um, yeah. Maybe we can show people this kind of stuff afterwards, if that's okay. Yeah, I'll move on. Yeah, so thank you. anyway, the thermal drone survey, which is probably what everybody's really, really excited about. Right. Um, we conducted this thermal drone survey. I'd read about it having been conducted over in England, and I thought it would be interesting to carry it out over here. And we got a company called Digital Fauna in uh, in March of 2022. Uh, they conducted a series of flights over two nights, those two nights, 18 flights in total, and they covered 28 square kilometers. And uh, the estate itself is about 22. So again, they're covering a bit more than, than what we actually own. And that takes into account of the fact we have uh, sporting rights beyond the ownership. Um, that survey counted 561 deer and that's probably the best indication we've ever had as to how many deer we've got at Barron's Court and you can apply all sorts of parameters or assumptions as to how many you might have missed but say if we miss 30 percent which the surveyor thinks is unlikely we maybe have a population of 729 but if we take that figure of 561 uh, we've got a deer ratio of 19, close to 20 deer per square kilometre. And um, ultimately, the, the literature and the guidance around CCF would suggest that you need to have a deer population of between 5 to 10. Uh, so we're, we're way over. And the herbivore impact assessment, which we referred to beforehand, uh, was, was telling us that we were getting high levels of browsing damage. So combined with, with this drone survey, that really confirmed in some respects what we already knew, but we now have really good um, data on, on this one. And um, that ultimately, you know, what we concluded was that for us to be bringing the deer population of Barons Court down based on that population of 561, we need to be shooting at least 220, 230 deer a year, uh, or, or sorry, uh, shooting much more than what we're currently shooting. Um, the, the number of deer observed at Barron's Court through the drone survey was 561. And as a rule of thumb, if you were to divide that population in two between male and female, you've got 280 hinds. And assuming, and this is a cautious uh, assumption, that 80% of those hinds are uh, breeding in the first year, they're recruiting 224 calves into the herd every year. And if I go back to our 10-year stats, you'll remember that our cull is actually in and around that. So all we've been doing is maintaining the status quo according to these numbers. So that really underlined the need for us to increase our... our um, our uh, cull target basically and um, that combined with obviously the herbivore impact assessment uh, made, us, made a, a couple of decisions but we ultimately ended up employing a full-time deer stalker um, and this is his first season with us at the moment and we can talk maybe a bit more about that if we've got time but um, it was a game changer having the thermal drone survey it gave us data it really gave us a figure per square kilometer which led us to make some big management decisions uh, such as employing a full-time stalker but it's now given us a target to work to and we can repeat this survey probably we won't do it this year we'll do it next year see how we've got on and then we can uh, we can tweak our um, management approach accordingly um i I also just want to finish off uh, with a shameless plug, but also this is really important because it uh, touches on what um, Teddy was talking about. Again, one of the recommendations was to get the venison market right, because we have to have a venison market. We have to have a market for, for these deer to go to if we're going to be culling more. And because we've invested in our game larder, we've invested in our, our team, um, we've got the skills, we've got the experience. We now have a really good food business and we are very successful in our, our uh, enterprise because we've been pretty pretty um, persistently successful in the Great Taste Awards. And this is the world's largest uh, long-standing food accreditation scheme. Um, forgive me, the stats are a bit old, but in 2022, there was 14,000 products entered. 
from over 100, uh, over 100 countries. Of those 14,000 products, uh, only 241 in that year, which is less than 2%, got the top, top award of three gold stars. And uh, two and one gold stars, obviously, are awarded as well for other products as well. Um, the products are all blind tested by up to 500 judges, and the judging takes place over 90 days. Pretty intense. And we've done very well. So since 2018, apart sorry, from 2018, we've entered every year since 2014. We've Today, we can show you we've got 45 gold stars over that period for our loin, our French rack, sausages and burgers. And our loin and French rack are really persistently, or sorry, consistently achieving the that coveted three-star award. Um, we've had it now, what's that, five, six years or something like that. And in uh, 2015 and 2022, we got the top award in Northern Ireland for our food. So it's a great product. It's beautiful for those of you who enjoy it. Um, we, we think Seek is good, particularly uh, a good reputation. But um, again, it's all part of the mix. We've got the training. We've got the BASC. We've got the food. We've got the professional team. We've got the surveys. All of that makes it work. And uh, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're trying our best to, to do it in a, in a sustainable and responsible way. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, there you go. That's wonderful. And you're, you're, you're rightly proud of what you're achieving there. Um, if I could move on maybe to the question and answer session now, um, if that's okay with people. Yeah. Um, there's a question here for Ted, for Teddy from Todrick Atuma. You mentioned including modules on deer management and forestry and agricultural colleges and universities and colleges. As the main problem from deer was the effect on biodiversity, should the modules on deer management be also included in biodiversity and ecology courses? Seems like a very reasonable question. Maybe Teddy might want to take that one. Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, we brought it out where it, it, it's going to be most use. We don't have any real issue with that. Um, it's a question of it, it's the, it's putting together the module and, and the the um, the content is the, is this is where the work needs to be done. And what we've been told at the moment is that um, if we want to get this done for the next season, we want to be working on it just now so that to be presented to colleges or different educational um inter or educational places of education before the summer. Um so you won't get it in everywhere this year, but um um it came up at our last meeting last week and it is an issue that we're um it came up at our um meeting last week and it's an issue that that that's being pursued at the moment. So um no I, I don't have any issues around the biodiversity piece um, and the ecology courses it's in, in um, an area that needs to be addressed as well so we, we look into that thank you great thanks Teddy so there's a few questions here I think maybe Dara's your question was answered in what percentage of the overall population are you calling that was for Matt I think population was maybe estimated to be quite large so probably less than half was being called um if you wanted to take that Matt. Yeah, well, I think, yes, I think it did. I mean, I think, as I said, the drone survey, um, which is the the, the best uh, way of the, our best guess as to how many deer we have is they counted 561. Um, the the severe, as I said, this, these surveys are conducted at night um, at, I think it was in March. So, you know, tree cover on the deciduous woodlands would have been pretty minimal. But obviously anything in uh, thicket stage Sitka, for example, might be very hard for uh, to pick up deer. But he was very confident that he saw the majority of them. So he's putting a population there at, at 561. And yeah, our call is, uh, is is on average 200, 220. Right. So about half. But you think you need to do more than that? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So comment from Connor Gaffney. You already had wildlife management modules and deer in college. That's good to know. Um, Let's see. Um, interesting to note that relying on recreational hunters wasn't sufficient. Is it part of the DMU proposal to fund professional stalkers and hotspots to bring down numbers? Recreation hunters can't be relied on. They only have so much free time. That's fair enough. Maybe that's for you, Teddy, I think, is it? Well, I suppose that's an, an issue we'll have to do in, in, in conjunction with the DMUs and, and it will relate to the, the populations in an area. And, um, you know, we have to do the research um, area by area and that one is what's appropriate. So I can't answer it definitively because we don't have, um, you know, you take parts of Wicklow versus other parts of the country that the populations are going to be a lot higher. You're going to have to have a different approach. So the question is, you know, from our perspective, the first stage is to get a program manager in place and then to get DMU set up. 
And then the next stage then is, is what's going to be the plan for each DMU based on the, the, the scenarios within that and what funding we can get to, 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 to get behind that if there's funding needed to, to deal with that. So it's we're not that far along the line yet, but there's nothing being ruled in or ruled out. It, it will depend on the case by case basis for when relating to the population in a particular area and, and the impacts that are it's having. Okay. I, I, I would just say uh, one of the things I was on a another webinar I think um, about by deer, and there was a forestry commissioner ranger who made the point that um, you know you wouldn't rely on a volunteer base if you're managing a forest to a volunteer to harvest your trees or a volunteer to plant your trees, and you should be looking at you, you pay people to do that job because you know you want it done, and if you look at deer management in that way. You, you should be paying somebody to do your deer management. Now, we're trying to harness volunteers as well as uh, as our staff, and uh, it is very much a team. We couldn't do it without them, but we're trying to harness them both. But to me, that was quite a, an interesting comment, which made us, made us think, and ultimately we've ended up employing somebody whose full-time job is to, to cull deer during the season. Okay, there's a comment here, kind of the flip side of that. So mm -hmm. Alex Denby is wondering, um, he spent a lot of time in diesel building up a block of permissions in West Cork from farmers and to have that under mine would be very frustrating when definitely could could relate to that. And I suppose, Teddy, people, some of the people that you would have met with when you were doing your um, stakeholder work would be people like that. So you probably heard from them. Yeah, and I suppose it, it comes down to, and I mean, if I just give, you know, I would have spoken to a number of people who heard that they, 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 you know, come together in the local area and, and and somebody had um, permissions and, and had was an established hunter. And if there was an established target being, you know, it's 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 about a consistency of approach. If there's a consistent approach in an area and, and it's working, it you know, that that would be supported. There's no doubt about that. But what we're trying to promote here is um, the uh, a collaborative approach in dealing with the issue. So whoever is involved in the area that they would engage, that everybody engages together to deal with the problem. And if that cannot be done in, the, in, in that scenario, that there will have to be extra resources brought in where necessary to do so. And that's the piece. But as I said, I can't get into the, um, the nitty gritty um, in a local area without you know, the, 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 yeah. all the facts in relation to an area involved, you know? Okay, that's fair enough. There's a comment here about the positive impacts of deer when they're managed properly. And there's a link to some research. So I suppose we'll have that. We can maybe put that out to our members um, after the event um is there a company this is for teddy or matt and the company on the island that can do drone deer service this is part of the national strategy and someone else wants to know what kind of cost for the drone survey um i guess one from ash yeah look ha happy to just look the, the cost was i think in the region of three thousand sterling so it's not cheap um from memory, this was a guy coming from Hampshire, so he came in his vehicle. There's travel and uh, uh, substance, shall we say, involved in that. Um, we would really love to have somebody from here um, capable of doing that. And I think that's coming. I mean, drones are being used. Everybody seems to have a drone now. But what what we would love... To, the, the guy we used was particularly brilliant because he was the perfect combination in that he was a telecoms consultant, so he was a bit techy. He, I think, had an ecology background, but he also loved his deer stalking. So he ticked all the all the boxes. Um, but there'll be people like that. And I think, you know, we've got to think about working collaborative, collaboratively, I think, to try and, you know, get a thermal drone resource because they're, they are brilliant. And I, I think the demand's going to grow. Um, maybe we'll form a very important part of your strategy uh, with you as well, um, Teddy. An opportunity I, there, yeah. A big opportunity. I'm not aware of anybody here, but uh, pl please, if anybody knows, uh, let us know. Let Anna know and get back to us because we'd love to use somebody local, as it were. There's a question here about networks for putting foresters and farmers with deer problems in contact with stalkers. Um, I don't know if that's part of the strategy, Teddy. That's coming. Oh, oh, that's that's very much what a DMU is about. I mean, that's what a deer management unit is is about. A local group in an area that that brings everybody together. And I mean, that's why we want to get a program manager in place so there's a contact point around the country that, that, that we can create this network. And you know, I know a lot of deer hunters out there do an awful lot of work in areas where there, where there are fairly severe impacts and there's a lot of engagement in places. And there are a number of examples of that around the country where it's working reasonably well. But um, um, it's just to, to make that more um, 
more um, widespread really and, and to put a bit of structure around it so people can have a phone number or some something that they can if you have a problem there and you don't know who to contact that there is there's somewhere to go okay very good um there's a question here about measuring numbers to manage appropriately how can deer numbers be managed without a comprehensive study into deer numbers is there a plan to carry out a national deer herd count before culling no is the answer <laughs> I think it's clear that there's a problem. So I suppose that that would make sense to, to well, just... No, it, it comes back to the point I made earlier. I mean, the deer calling or deer management is going to happen where the impacts are most. And that's the issue with deer impacts. You're not out here to um, exterminate deer. That's not the, 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 the target here. What you're trying, trying to do here is to bring deer to a population that's sustainable for both for the deer and for the, the ecology around them and for the forestry and, and in, in the general the general community that they that they're, they're, they reside. So it's this is not an extermination policy. It's about deer management is what you're dealing with here. So it will be very much around where the greatest impacts are. And there are about five or six counties in Ireland where the, the impacts are, are large from deer. And that, that's where the concentration of effort is going to be. And um, that I think that's an important point to make. It's, it will be impact based. So let's say, for instance, I've been long-winded now, you have a lot of road accidents in the area and that are quantifiable. In an area then and then you know you will look at reducing deer numbers in that scenario if you have you know severe browsing in forestry extreme browsing in forestry and, and forestry can be generated in relation to what matt is speaking about there and, and what matt has described earlier on well that merits um an increased coal policy in an area like that to get deer into a, an area back into numbers that are sustainable on both sides so you know it will be impacts because there's no way i mean what they say at the moment is in Ireland, we have got something around four to six hundred thousand year plus or minus thirty percent. So it's impossible to count the property. You know, there there is certain amount of be work being done around it, and you see deer working on the smart deer program, and there's some cameras, and but you know they're only snapshots in particular areas. But you know it will be around impacts is the most, uh, and part of the process we're talking about here is measurements of impacts and improvements or dis disimprovements in an area to. And there, there are areas that we can relate to to, to measure um, what's happening, whether we're getting plus or minus on, in a situation. Great. Thank you. Now, there's a comment here from Martin Curran, which seems like he's answering the question, can we have somebody here who can do the drone surveys? Oh. So maybe it's worth checking out Midland Deer Stalking Ireland. I assume yeah. that's a website. Thank you. And that, and that they're able, I mean, Martin, you might you might comment there, but it seems like they, they have the abilities to do that. So that, that's that's a, certainly information worth passing on here. Um, let's see. We need to be wrapping up fairly soon here. I'm just trying to see what questions. Okay, there is, there's more drone. There's a Mayo company that does thermal drone surveys. So it seems like drone data.ie, there might, there might be um, people that do it here. Okay, there's a link. I can't really go there right now. Um, Okay, there's somebody says, what sort of person will run DMUs? How do we go about setting one up locally in South Galway? Plenty of interest from landowners. Hi, Anne, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Anne. Hi, guys. Martin Curran here. Um, I work with a team of guys in Scotland and some of their estates. And we've been using drones for the last couple of years and they're finding it very good. Great. So you're you're able to provide drone work here then in Ireland. You, If somebody, a forester, wanted to count the deer, you'd yeah, be able to... So Basically, I'm after being I'm after being looking at this and hearing from it uh, for the last maybe a year, and uh, I'm a recreational hunter, but I'm also a professional hunter as well, and do deer a lot of deer management outside of Ireland. But what I'm looking at is to kind of set up a teams with drones, with thermal drones here. So right. I think, okay, I think, I think we would benefit from it. So if anybody's interested, do you have a website that people can just maybe stick it up into the chat? So if there's a website that people can contact you or an email, then yeah. people can get on to you after this meeting. Would that be yeah. okay? Yeah, that'd be perfect. All right. Good stuff. Thanks. Thanks for coming in on that Thanks, one. Dan. Thank you. Um, there's also the drone guys, thermal imaging. So there seems to be um, a fair amount of it. So that's great. Um, I'm not seeing else that I, I might just start bringing things to a close at this point because um We've certainly gone over the time, but I think it's definitely been worthwhile and where people are dropping off as well. It's been worthwhile having the discussion and uh, it's it's been great and uh, lively. Um, I don't know if you wanted to come in, Manus, on anything. Um, 
I have a few slides, kind of a few wrap up slides to do here. So I would bring those up in a minute if if that's OK with people. Um, just briefly, yeah, I'm just going to just just yep. before you do that, just to thank uh, the two speakers. It's, it's obviously a massive subject and both of the lads could probably have an entire webinar to themselves in fairness. So um, something to think about. But uh, no, really, really interesting stuff. Thanks, uh, Teddy, for giving the synopsis so far on the, the deer strategy. And Matt, that, you kind of got into the meaty stuff at the end there, the, the, the drone survey and that. It's, it's really, really interesting. And I'd say every forest owner in the country's ears perked up when they heard about that. You know, it's... it's because like it's quite interesting. You're doing walkover surveys, and you're you're seeing maybe three hundred animals, and then you're doing the drone surveys. You're seeing five or six hundred, and you still think that it's in all the animals. So it would be useful if you could do a drone survey, and then ground test it and know that you know perhaps you're fifty percent off in a ground ground survey. You know that there might be ways of doing that. But uh, no, really interesting stuff. Just just thanks, Maiden from Pro Silver for contributing your time and all, and um, really really interesting stuff. So. Thank you. Um, just to let you know what's going on with Post Silver for the rest of the year, um, there's another webinar on in the middle of March, Afforestation and Forest Design with CCF Principals, a Spring Field Day in County Down, a Joint Field Day with the ITGA, an Autumn Field Day in AGM County Galway, and there'll be lots more events happening, afternoon events in Forest. Um, if you're not a member of Post Silver, you might want to join. You don't need to have a Forest to be a member, and you can go to their website um, and click on that link. You can follow us on Facebook. Um, this webinar was recorded, so it'll be uploaded to YouTube at some point in time, but there's also other webinars are up on, on, on YouTube as well. So that's it, I think. Thanks for joining us today.